So the next thing on our agenda is to review lesson 51 and that is going to lead us into talking about can you do 51. I intentionally didn't put up solutions for the can you do because I knew that we would talk about it in class today. It was a really short can you do so um, it's easier for me to spend some class time going through it. The longer ones just take too long. So where we started last time was we want to start um, making estimates for a population value by taking a sample. The reason that we want to take a sample is because sometimes it's just not feasible or um, reasonable to look at the entire population. So instead, we take a sample. If you are looking at an average, your parameter is mu and your sample statistic is x bar. So if you're looking at finding the average of a population, you're using mu and x bar. So that leads right into question one and two on your can you do. So it gives you a, a scenario and it wants you to identify the um, parameter and the statistic. Is that true? Are those the two? Yes. So um, thank you. Notice up here that it says you don't have to state whether it's a parameter or a statistic because I wrote it down for you, but use the appropriate notation. So mu equals 15 or X bar equals whatever. So on this first one, a large container full of ball bearings with a mean diameter of 2.5003 centimeters. Um, so a large container is full of that. That is your true population value. These ball bearings were made to the specification that their average diameter is 2.5 centimeters. So I should put units on there too. This is the population um, parameter. Now, depending on the size of the container, there's probably thousands of ball bearings in this container. So if we wanted to know the true average, are we really going to look at all thousands of those bearings? No, that's not realistic. Well, how do I know that this is the population then if I don't want to go through and look at all the ball bearings? Because a machine makes them, and the machine is set to make them with a diameter of 2.5. So um, this is within the specifications for acceptance of the container by the purchaser. By chance, an inspector chooses 100 bearings from the container and they have a mean diameter of 2.5009. This is your statistic. And if you, um, depending on what kind of engineer you are, engineers do this frequently. So I, um, my husband is an engineer. He's a manufacturing engineer, which means he works at a company that builds parts for rocket launchers for the Department of Defense. So the Department of Defense sends them these specifications and says, we need these pieces to be exactly this size, exactly this weight. They all need to be made exactly the same. So they hire workers and they put together the parts. But are workers perfect? No. Are they going to make mistakes? Yes. Even if it were a machine, machines get worn down. Eventually, after you use them so much, they could also make errors. So what a lot of companies do is they take samples to verify that their specifications are being met. So the company has likely a machine that's supposed to make them this size. You take a sample to verify that's what's happening and this was your sample diameter. Does this make a little bit of sense? Yes. So
No, so N equals 100 is your sample size. We don't know what capital N is, and we don't need to know the population size. We just need to know what the um, average diameter should be. So down here, this one is similar. A random sample of college students has a mean height of 64.5, which is greater than the 63-inch mean height of all adult American women. So which one's mu? 64 or 63? 63. Your population is all adult American women, and they're telling you that that average height is 63. The symbols do matter. You need to know the difference between mu and x bar. Um, in this case, they don't tell us either size. They don't tell us the size of capital N or the size of little n. Does that help on um, numbers one and two that clarify things? Okay, so then what we did after we talked about in our notes, we have a population from which we can take a sample because that's usually the only way we can get information about the population. We started talking more specifically about those samples. So we went through in detail and talked about the difference between a population distribution and a sampling distribution. So when we take samples, we're often going to get different values um, from each sample. So if I take a sample of two of your test scores and get an average of 80, and then I take a sample of another two, the chances they're going to have an 80 is very small. That's called sampling variability. It's it's natural and okay for your samples to differ um, when you're taking diff when you're taking multiple samples. So we looked at this is our population distribution, this is our sampling distribution, and we have to keep in mind that our sampling distribution is all possible samples. So this is a true sampling distribution. Then we went in and did a much bigger one. But technically, this isn't, this isn't a true sampling distribution because this is not all possible samples of size 5. So we um, labeled this point right here. And I worried afterward that lots of you guys thought that I chose to label that one because he's an outlier. And I didn't choose to label that one for, the, for that reason. This one was just far enough away that I had enough space to actually write what it was. So on your Can You Do 51, where it wants you to describe what the point at 62.4 is, you could say the dot represents one simulated sample of 20 students that had an average height of 62.4 inches. So one thing that you may not have added in is this simulated sample part. So one thing we didn't talk about last time is that when we talk about a sampling distribution, a lot of the times to get that sampling distribution, the ones we talk about in class, they're computer simulated. Um, so all it's saying is this, uh, this dot plot was created by a computer running a program that would simulate the kinds of samples we would probably get. So I just wanted to make sure that I was specific on that in the problem. Okay, so let's go through the last page and that will lead us into proportions.
Okay, so we have five kids in a gymnastics class and we wanna know how far they can walk on their hands. The population is the five kids. The population is the five kids. The parameter, the true mu, is the actual values that their coach or instructor took. So we can calculate true mu to be 20 steps because our population is the five kids and they had these numbers, so this is their true parameter. Now this is kind of an unrealistic scenario though because when you just have five kids, you don't need to take a sample. Averaging five numbers is easy. They're using this example though to help you understand a sampling distribution. If you get a population much bigger than five, you can't list out all of the averages. It takes too long. So this is an unrealistic situation because you would never do this for five kids. We're just doing it to help understand the process. So here are all my samples. They say, okay, let's pretend like this population of five kids is too much to manage and let's estimate how much they can, uh, how many steps they can take by just looking at two kids. So we go through and list what are the possible um, averages that we could get for all of, all samples of size two. So I just wanna note my, or highlight my notation here. What this means is that this is the average for Ashley and Brittany, that's their sample average. This is Ashley and Carol, and I put sub X bar because that's their sample average. You are not required to do that because we did not discuss that at all, um, but it might be helpful for you to write it on a couple so you know how you could describe that using letters. And then lastly, it says make a display of the sampling distribution and it is a true sampling distribution so ignore what i have in red sorry i'm trying to zoom out ignore what i have in red and just check your to see if yours looks like mine Did you guys do okay no Okay, so I want you to keep this because we're gonna come back to what I have written in red by the end of today's lesson. So the biggest takeaways from last time are, we want to estimate, we wanted to estimate the average value of something for a population. In order to do that, we can take a sample and just calculate their average. Why can we do this? because of this thing called a sampling distribution. That is the basics of what we went over last time. Are you feeling okay? Okay, so we discussed that this is not the only thing we can estimate. We don't just wanna know the mean of a population. We might wanna know a proportion or a percent from the population or range, IQR, median, we can estimate more than just the average from a sample or from a population. That's where we start today with the shapes. So we're on the back of this page. And at the top it says, now let's look at the sampling distribution for a proportion. Yellow highlighter, where are you at? So last time we looked at the sampling distribution for a mean. Today we're looking at the sampling distribution for a proportion. On this side, just kidding. On this side, I have this one, the sampling distribution for a mean highlighted. So now we're on the proportion. The symbols for this are going to be P and P hat. 
P is your population proportion. P hat is your sample proportion. And the example that we're going to look at to do this is uh, on handedness. How many uh, kids or what percent of kids in a population are left handed? And we know that left handedness is kind of rare. So it says in a population of 200 students, 24 are left handed. So this is our population information. So the blue circles are our right handed kids. Orange squares are our left-handed kids. This is the population distribution. This bar chart is our population distribution. Why all of a sudden are we doing a bar chart instead of a dot plot? Well, this is categorical data. So one category is right-handed, the other category is left-handed. So because it's categorical data, how we graph it is as a bar chart or a pie graph. Um, you can see that this is relative frequency, so just remind yourself that that's percent. Relative frequency is percent. And if we just wanted to verify, we could take 24 out of 200 and change that to the percent. So we would do 24 divided by 200, that's 12%. So we're looking at the population of left-handed, the percent of left-handed students. So what we just calculated was P. P is 12%. This bar represents 12%, which means this bar is 88%. 88% 88 are right-handed. You're hanging in? Okay. We take a sample. So instead of looking at these 200 students, we are just going to take a sample of, let me remind myself, I think it might be 30. Oh, it's 50. We take a sample of 50 students. So for each of these, our sample size is 50. For each of these, our sample size is 50. And it's hard to see because I had to make it so small to fit on our page, but the 50 kids that were selected, their colors show up. So you'll see a certain amount of blue dots and a certain amount of orange squares that are in the real color. The ones that are gray are the kids that did not get selected for the sample. So this is sample one. And in this sample, because I don't want you guys to go blind, I'll just tell you how many are in there. We got a P hat, an estimated proportion of five out of 50. So if you, you can count up the orange squares pretty easily. Our sample had five kids that were left-handed. We change that to a percent, that's 10%. We know that the true proportion is 12. In our first sample, we got 10. Is that unusual? No. In this case, we ended up underestimating our value. In this case, this was an underestimate. So sample two, how many, how many of those guys? Seven. So seven out of 50. So in this sample, 14% of the students are left-handed. We take another sample and we get how many on the, oh no. Did yours have a hole punch through it? <laughs> how many are orange? 
One, two, three, six. Okay, I'm pretty sure that's right. And our third sample is, is one where it matches exactly. These different values are an example of sampling variability. We take three different samples. It is okay and reasonable and expected that they would have different values. So one is an underestimate. I'm going to highlight them in different colors for the next part of this. So we have one underestimate. That's my 10%. We had one overestimate, and then we had one guy that matches exactly. So up at the top, we have our population distribution for every kid in the population. We have a bar graph. So down here, these bar graphs underneath each sample are the individual sample distributions. So I'm going to be really specific. This is sample one distribution. And notice he is a bar graph again. This is sample two distribution. This is sample three distribution. So our population can be graphed using a bar chart and our individual samples can be graphed using bar charts. And the scale is really horrible on these bar graphs, but you can see that one is higher, one has the lowest, and one is kind of in between. So this one is 10%, this one is 14%, this one is 12%. And remember, these are all P hats. So this now leads us into the sampling distribution for a proportion. So we have three different ideas going on here. We have a population distribution. We have an individual sample distribution. And now we're going to put together all of our possible samples of size 50. So I'm going to leave space and down toward the bottom. I'm going to start at 9 and I'm going to go up to 15. we're going to talk about what this sampling distribution will end up looking like. Okay, well, we have three ones, three samples that we can add to this. And I'm going to, instead of doing a dot, I'm going to put down a P hat. So we had a sample that had 10%. I guess under here I should be. Percent of left-handed students. In each sample. So in one sample it was 10. In one of our samples, we matched exactly the true value of 12. And in one sample, we overestimated at 14. And I'm going to carry on that highlighting so that I know which sample is the ones that I found. Eight. 
in a sampling distribution of 200 people where we can choose 50, I bet you there are a million, um, at least a million different ways to do that. I forgot that I didn't sham a llama. Math, maybe it's in probability. Oh, it is. So remember how I told you we can find the number of samples by doing this combinatorics thing? So I'm going to do that. Clear. We have... Two hundred choose fifty. Oh man, four point five times ten to the forty seven. So is that a lot of possible samples? Yeah, that's like a bajillion samples. What ends up happening if we're actually going to graph all of those bajillion samples is we end up getting some samples in each area of our graph. So I'm, I'm adding in P hats at every tick mark. But what you end up seeing is that eventually all of your samples are clustered around the true value. And what this starts to look like is a normal curve. So if we actually took those bajillion examples and put every single sample down, what we would end up seeing is a normal distribution that is clustered around the true value of P equals 12%. So it is all clustered around our true value. It's the same idea as the mean. The only difference is the individual distributions, we have a bar graph this time instead of a dot plot. You're hanging in? You're sure? Okay. So let's have you guys try the um, lesson questions and then we will finish our last page. 